Hi, Jack. It's Margie with Basmati. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you. Today we're talking with Jack from FindingTwoMagic.com, and he is a certified hypnotherapist um, and teacher, practitioner, and going to share his story with us um, and, and how he came to do what he's doing. Um, so let's go for it, Jack. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank Margie. I really appreciate this opportunity to share about my work. Uh, I want to say a little bit about the uh, present time and then go back to when I started. Uh, I just completed uh, an annual 17-day uh, hypnotherapy certification training that I give. And it was my 30th annual training. So uh, I'm kind of a beginner, so you'll have to be kind (laughs) to me. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I, I, in researching your trainings, they're pretty amazing. So um, a little bit of a beginner, but you know, there may be some wisdom involved in this. I don't know. (laughs) Okay. So um, my my work is uh, completely uh, uh, colored and shaped by my lifelong interest in Buddhism. I I picked up a little book in my freshman year of college called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones. It was a little translation of some haiku poems by Paul Retz, and this is 1966. So there might have been three Buddhist books in the whole country at that point. Um, but it, it resonated with me very strongly, and I felt like I'd come home. And so I sought out those other two or three books, and, and I read them too. And then at the end of my sophomore year, the next year, someone handed me a brochure, just a, just an acquaintance just walked up to me and said, here, you might be interested in this. And it was a brochure about the first Zen Buddhist monastery opening in America, and which is... Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, which is in California where you are, which mm-hmm. is the, the monastery that's a part of Zen Center of San Francisco uh, and Green Gulch Farm in Marin County. So I got the brochure, and two weeks later I was at Tassajara. <laughs> and so I had no idea of my good fortune. I didn't, I didn't know that... A, a, a supremely accomplished meditation master was the center of, of Zen Center, Shinryu Suzuki Roshi, whose uh, book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, is a, is a classic, sold millions of copies by now. He, he was just a great, great teacher. And uh, so I had extremely good fortune. I just fell into that situation, you could say. And... Uh, uh, so that was 1967, and I kept uh, uh, studying and practicing Buddha, Buddhism intensely. Roshi died in 1971, and just before he died, he uh, met, or I should say, a, travel, a Tibetan teacher traveled through town, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who was another supreme teacher, and he had total love and respect for Suzuki Roshi, and so it was obvious to me that I would study with him once Roshi passed away, and I did do that. I moved to Boulder, Colorado, and studied with Trump Rinpoche for 16 years until he passed away. So while I was in Boulder uh, in, uh, in 1976, I, I got married and started having kids, so I had to get a real job. Up until then, I was doing odd jobs and mainly meditating and studying. And so I got a job in sales, various kinds of sales, and I always felt like I had something uh, to offer people, and I was helping people, and but I always had this feeling like the product was in the way. And uh, in 1980, I took a, an NLP training, and... I was probably the only one in the course that wasn't a psychologist, and they were all being blown away by what was being taught. But for me, it was very familiar, and it was like little bits and pieces of 
Buddhist teachings that I had been studying in a much more comprehensive way. So two things happened for me. One, I no longer felt any kind of regret that I dropped out of college to enter a Buddhist monastery because looking around at these psychologists, I thought, well, if they weren't teach teaching you this stuff in college, what were they teaching you? So mm -hmm. my illusion that I had missed something, not completing my college education, evaporated. And secondly, I saw that these Western teachings were a, a great way to filter through the, the more comprehensive Buddhist teachings to Westerners without it being, seeming foreign to them. But now I had another dilemma because now I have four kids and I thought, well, I can't, I can't do this now. I, you know, I've got a <laughs> kids. I, I, you know, I could lose everything if I try to switch careers now. So it was, just became kind of a longing. And then, and so that was 1980. 1986, my oldest daughter was diagnosed with a terminal illness, pulmonary hypertension, and we were uh, told to move the sea level immediately. They put her on oxygen because it's closing off the blood vessels in the lungs. So within a few weeks, we were totally ripped out of our life, uh, away from our friends, away from our teacher, away from my livelihood, everything. Just boom. We ended up on uh, deciding to live on Orcas Island. And they, they told us to move the sea level because boulders at 5,000 feet, and my mm -hmm. daughter, you know, so... So I, I was her primary caregiver uh, for five and a half years until she passed away. She was on oxygen 24 hours a day. And so that was a great, uh, a blessed task and a great teaching for me. And in 1988, I separated from her mom and I moved to Bellingham, which is on the mainland, and figured, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And I decided to see if there was a hypnotherapy training around, and there was in Seattle. And so the irony of ironies, and it pretty much happens this way all the time, like I had, had stopped myself from pursuing my passion because I thought I might lose everything, and here I am having lost everything, and now I'm going to pursue my passion. Uh-huh. <laughs> that true self was an inner calling, right? That's how I view it is. Like we, we, it, there's something inside of us, and when we can align to that, um, either by outside circumstances or by choice, right? It's easier by choice, I think. <laughs> um, we we find our way, right? Absolutely. Yes. So I, so. I took course in uh, July of '88, and the teacher was uh, courageous enough and generous enough to see that I had so much to offer from because of my background that he just had me start teaching with him in the, in the course. And I kept teaching with him. We had a, a partnership, and uh, about two years later, he left town, and so I took it over, and I transformed it more in, in alignment with my Buddhist teachings. And so I, I've been, I've been uh, constantly teaching and seeing clients since July of 1988. Beautiful. Uh, I feel very fortunate, very fortunate. I do, too. Uh, and... and um, I mean, you have an amazing book that I think everyone should read, Finding True Magic, whether you're in hypnotherapy or just in in any um, inner work. It's it's a really beautiful read. Um, I would like to ask you a couple questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, can you tell me the difference, um, for anyone listening who would be interested, in the difference in hypnosis and hypnotherapy? Sure. There's a, there's a very good uh, distinction that I like to make this, that I didn't invent. It's, it's a very common explanation. Is uh, Hypnosis is just giving suggestions. And you could give somebody, uh, if you were in rapport with them and created the proper linguistic suggestion, you could like, for example, you could give them a a uh, bunch of suggestions and hypnosis for them to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. And they would even not smoke. But within a few weeks or a couple months, they would smoke, they'd be smoking again. And the reason for that is that hypnosis is like uh, pulling the tops off a dandelion. You know, they're instantly yeah. gone from vision, 
but the root is still there and it's going to reassert itself. So that's the problem with just hypnosis. Hypnotherapy is doing using the vehicle of the hypnotic technique to, that just basically connects people to their own inner resources in a more uh, efficient and profound way than they ordinarily are in their uh, programmed daily consciousness. So using the hypnosis to connect people to that deeper ability to reorganize things, plus introducing therapy to get rid of the root of the problem, then it doesn't recur. Got it. That's the difference between hip just simple hypnosis and hypnotherapy. You bring in the therapy, taking advantage of the healing power that's opened up by using the hypnotic process to quickly and, and pretty much painlessly get rid of the, the root of the problem, and then it won't come back. Nice. Um, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that um, that I could, I'll elaborate with you um, later, but... Um, can we get into some of the um, myths and archetypes? Um, sure. Okay. Sure. Perfect. Tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, to my mind, the most important thing to understand about archetypes, because uh, the, there's archetypes are presented in, in myriads of symbolic ways, and people can kind of lose their way getting uh, inappropriately fascinated with the richness of the metaphors and lose sight of uh, what, to my mind, is most important, which is that the concept of archetype is recognizing universal patterns, universal function, and universal essence. So the concept archetype is pointing at the living substance of the phenomenal world, which includes our being and our consciousness. And, and when you recognize that there are these universal patterns permeating everywhere and governing any, everything, then that has a, a, one of the most uh, practical, useful uh, outcomes of recognizing that is that it, it helps a person to release their shame and release their uh, uh, the ways in which they are critical of themselves. Because when you understand about archetypes, you realize that you don't own your emotions, that you're not experiencing my emotions. You're experiencing human emotions. So emotional experiences don't prove that there's something wrong with you. And that's, a, frankly... You know, the way I teach because of my Buddhist background is that everybody's in hypnosis all the time. Yes. Who, who you think you are is just a hypnotic trance. And one of, the, one of the terrible secondary layers of unnecessary hypnotic trance is that people have been taught to believe that certain kinds of emotions prove that there's something wrong with them. Now, you're not supposed to have them if you're a decent person. And that's just a terrible, destructive negative hypnotic suggestion. The fact is all emotions are human emotions. Any human being can experience them. Nobody owns them. And they all arise because of a certain condition, mainly how we've been taught to think. Emotions are a response to the way we think. None of them are required in any situation. If they were, we'd all have the same emotions in a given situation. And, and you know from your own life experience, many People have different mo uh, emotions in the same experience. You know, they come out of a movie, and some people hate the movie, some people love the movie. That's the and analogy. Reverend, yeah, that's the analogy I use all the time. If five of us go to a movie, we're all going to have our favorite part, our most emotional response to parts, and typically they're different, and how we respond is different. You know, that's a that's a great way for all of us to realize what that feels like, right? And that it's a learned behavior. For sure. it's, it's not because of the movie. It's because of how we think. Mm -hmm. about it. Yes. yes. And so it's very important for people for people to understand, and most people don't. It's very simple and straightforward, but we're we're taught to miss it, which is that 
all of our perceptions, all the data that comes in through our senses, it doesn't mean anything until we give it meaning. And that's the way in which we create our experience. We don't create the world. Like people can, in some new age stuff, can get you know a little off center thinking, you know, I create my own reality. You don't create reality, but you do create your emotional experience because you determine the value and meaning that you give to what you perceive, and then your emotions are a response to that story that you tell yourself. Very, very much so. Very much so. So, and that's all hypnotic process. So it's happening all the time. It just doesn't. It doesn't only happen when you go to a hypnotist. Most hypnotherapists don't understand that. You know, a lot of hypnotherapy courses uh, go into great lengths to talk about hypnotizability, and some people can be, and some people can't, and testing for it and everything like that. I, I don't teach any of that to my students. Instead, I get them to recognize that ordinary everyday consciousness and uh, your subconscious gossip is just one hypnotic suggestion after another, quite literally. You know, I love, it's, um, this, it brings it back to where I wanted to go back a little bit earlier, but the waking up in your true self, and, yeah. and that's what this is really about. Um, and um, I, I love that you bring, that's really what this is all about, is breaking our hypnotic state, right? And and really waking up, which is kind of funny, right, since you're uh, hip, do hypnotherapy, but it's so true. It's so true. Um, let's, let's touch a little bit on inner guidance. Okay. Um, um, well, let me just say, first of all, Buddhism is not a religion in the sense that it's not based upon belief. It's more uh, a science of mind, which uh, is based upon uh, study and observation uh, of life and of how the mind works. So the Buddhism, Buddhist meditators have studied how the mind functions to uh, incredible depths and subtleties so, uh, uh, and pass that on. Those are the teachings of Buddhism, how to get free of the hypnotizing, deluding power of the thinking mind. And so one of the main problems of the thinking mind is that we solidify beliefs. We solidify beliefs about all kinds of things. And certainly, you know, throughout human history, people have been horrific to each other based on having different beliefs about God, and that's happening still right today. Uh, and also different political beliefs. It's just nasty, terrible stuff happening all the time. And all of that is just hypnotic suggestion. So in terms of inner guidance, what I emphasize to people, uh, whatever technique that we're doing, is that belief is not required. But you don't have to believe that there are inner guides. Like some people might say, well, what if I think it's just my intuition? And another person might say, well, I think it is a spiritual being. I say, you know, it, you can believe however you want to believe. The main thing is let's just do the process and see what beneficial results we get, because that's not based on belief. That's based on the relationship. Yeah. So it's fine with me if people believe in inner guide. It's fine with me if they don't. I say, well, let's just do it as a metaphor and see if something useful comes, because you know that you've had vivid dreams that you would even say are transformative or gave you some powerful insight into life, and it was just a dream. Yeah. So just because it's a dream doesn't mean it's not useful or important. So if you want to consider it just uh, hypnotic dreaming, we can do that. Yes, yeah, that's that's even breaking free of even more beliefs, right? Right. Yes. Getting exactly. through the getting through those layers of that. Yeah, because um, beliefs just limit us. They yes. just limit our ability to experience the depth of our functionality and the depth of our consciousness. Um, let's, if you're, let's, I'd like to chat a little bit about spirit release, um, because I found that really fascinating that you go into that a little bit, um, or. Yeah, oh, sure. But, okay. So, the, uh, when I talk about, uh, entity releasing or spirit releasing, it's specifically 
uh, a human being who's died and they're not realize they're dead or they're unwilling to uh, acknowledge their condition. And so in one way or another, they find someone to latch on to with varying degrees of strength. It can be relatively just annoying or it can be so powerful that they like really take over the person's body and, and run the show. So it's all different varying degrees. Yeah. But, uh, and then the releasing part is, this, they're not evil. The, the, the entity release process is actually a compassionate process yeah. for the entity because they're the one who are really have the problem because they're not admitting their actual condition. So it's done as a, as a compassionate gift to the entity. And once the entity is gone, the client will be fine. Yeah. Um, and, and it's very simple. It's basically you encourage them to uh, recognize that they're dead, which you can do in various ways, and, and you encourage them to go into the light. And the typical uh, obstacle that may have been in their way is the fear of being sent to hell. So you... Yeah and convince them that that's not going to happen, or they have some strong desire, they want to stay attached in the human realm and because they can make the person drink and they, they were alcoholic. And, but you can, uh, the, the interesting thing about this process is you can tell them that whatever they want is in the light. Yeah. And, and the best they've ever had in order to entice them to go. And no one has ever come back. I even give him a money back guarantee. If I tell someone like that, I say, "Look, the best whiskey is up in the light." And so, and if I'm not telling you the truth, you can come back. So yeah, you owe it to yourself to go check it out. They never come back. And it releases the the physical person here. Um, yeah, they're, they're released. Yeah. It reminds me of I I uh, was uh, before my mom was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer. Um, I lost both my parents recently. Well, my mom about four and a half years ago now. Um, but I had three friends in different areas, one in South America, one up in Canada, and one in Missouri, all recommend I read this book. And this is prior to her diagnosis. And it was the Tibetan book of the living and dying. I don't know if yeah. you've read that. Fabulous yeah. book. Oh, my goodness. A really, really just a, just a wonderful, wonderful book. So obviously I got this, I literally got calls and emails from them within a couple days uh, period. And I thought, oh, I'm going right down to the bookstore and getting this book, right? Because clearly I was needed to read it. And um, it, 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 it's so tremendously, and I have a lot of compassion in my heart anyway, but it, the depths of transitioning out and allowing people to go it was so tremendous and beneficial for me and it, when you were speaking for some reason that book popped in and it was really um it really helped me and so for anyone listening who may not understand what that's like it's um that's that's as real as as me sitting here chatting with you and yeah. um it's a it is a really compassionate loving gift you give to yourselves or to someone who's trying to transition out and and hasn't yet, it's a it's a really beautiful gift. So I'm I'm thank you for talking about that. Um, yeah. And then how about subpersonality or parts work? Um, sure. Can we go into a, okay? Perfect. Uh, sure. So this is an example of peop, of how we're in hypnotic trances all the time and not realizing it. We even though we are essentially one whole person. Our, our consciousness is, is so uh, powerful and free and creative, it has no problem compartmentalizing. And a lot of that compartmentalizing is very useful. Like, you don't have to constantly remember how to speak English. You don't have to constantly remember what your name is. You don't have to constantly remember how to drive or walk or ride a bicycle. Because once you learn those uh, bodies of knowledge, you're consciousness creates a, a part. It creates a compartmentalized part of your psyche that preserves those learnings and brings them online when they're needed. The problem is, is that it will also do that with unresolved emotional experiences. So if you're harmed in some way as a child, <clears throat> your, your mind will create 
like a little encapsulated virtual reality theater, and you will part part of your psyche will be in a hypnotic state in that little theater as the little four-year-old, let's say, that you used to be. And it will constantly be reliving that experience. And that portion of your psyche can take over and affect the way you react and relate in present time. In other words, this is, this is what is meant by projection, like somebody says, oh, you're just projecting. When you're projecting, uh, on a danger onto a situation that's harmless in present time is because something about the present time situation is similar enough to the child situation that that part of your psyche takes over and says, suddenly you're four years old and this thing is happening again, and so here other people looking at you see a seemingly an adult person freaking out in a basically benign situation, and they wonder what's going on. Yeah, that's what's going on. These mm -hmm. personalities can inappropriately take over and run their program, which is based on unresolved past issues, projecting them onto present time. And we are, all day long in our ordinary course of living, we're going in and out of subpersonalities constantly. We're just not aware of it. I mean, it's a lot of the times it's benign, like you might be waiting to check out in the grocery store and, you know, they have the those last little racks while you're yeah. waiting to get you, you know? And so you're standing there, part of me wants M&Ms and part of me wants a Snickers. That's an example of two subpersonalities, trying to negotiate and figure out who's going to get their way. So we're very familiar with it. No one, once I give people this little bit of explanation, no one ever has a problem with it in therapy. They go, oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely, you know? yeah. There's so, something uh, because because we're functioning in that way, it's very useful to use that metaphor. So if someone comes in with a problem, instead of simply relating the problem, you say, well, let's, you know, it's a recurring problem. That means it's a learning. That means there's a part of you that knows how to keep it alive and keep it going. So let's talk to that part of you and find out what it's trying to accomplish by making you have this problem. And in that way, we make friends with that part. And we wake it up that it's using obsolete childish strategies because when you were a child, that's when you formed the strategies that have been locked in place. So once you wake up that part and it realizes it's in present time and it can be an adult now and it doesn't have to rely on those uh, paltry resources of the child, then it very quickly will release the problem and integrate into being an adult. Yes. Beautiful. Um, let me, can I, I, so if someone wants to work with you, um, can can you work remotely? I, yeah, I work with people all over the world by, by phone and by Skype. Okay, and so you do private sessions. And what if someone's interested in training with you and how, so do they have to go, I know you just finished that program, which I um, was so interested in, um, and that was an on-site training. Um, right. But you, I, do, I, typically, I typically now do uh, two live trainings a year. I used to do four, uh, but I do two live trainings for certification, and I do some traveling to present seminars in other places, like I'm going to London uh, to do a four-day seminar at the end of September. Um, I just was in L.A. giving a one-day thing, and but in terms of training with me, you can come for live trainings, or I have a fantastic distance learning program that includes personal interaction with me. So it's not like you get a, a box of CDs. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, and, and you don't even need to get CDs and videos anymore. The whole thing's online. But it does include tutorials with me, so it's a very powerful course. It's a very transformative, powerful course. People can you can read the testimonials about my trainings at my website, FindingTrueMagic.com. Beautiful. And so, if someone wants to book a private session with you, they can also go to the website and they can go to the website. They email me from the website, but if they're listening, they can just email me directly at Jack at FindingTrueMagic.com. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, again, I'm I'm going to suggest anyone listening um, 
not only reach out, but, but get the book Finding True Magic. It's, it's unbelievable and amazing. And, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for you taking the time to chat with us today. And, um, thank you for raising the consciousness, um, of everyone you speak with, um, that all pushes out to the world. You know that there's that ripple effect. So, um, it's a beautiful gift you're sharing, um, with all of us. Thank you so much, Jack. And we'll chat again. I, I, uh, I'd love to do a little recording with you so everyone can see what this looks like. Um, and we'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Have a beautiful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.